Thank you for checking out the Following Films podcast YouTube version of it. Um, this is kind of a beta test right now. I'm planning on putting podcasts up a little bit more frequently with video. Tonight, it's just an audio-only podcast. So um, after the trailer, we'll get into the podcast itself. But tonight, it's going to be uh, with our guest, Josh Perlman, and we're going to be talking about um, Pat Healy's latest film, Carnage Park. I hope you enjoy it. Well, howdy. What you doing out here? A couple of fellas decided to hold up the farming bank. Woo! They were last seen driving in this direction. They ain't here. These boys took old Tom Fontaine's daughter with them. Not by her volunteer, of course. What's that got to do with me? How far is the scream travel out here, Wyatt? Not too far. Hey, Josh, how you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? Doing really well. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your night to do this, man. I appreciate no it. No problem. Thank you for asking. I appreciate it, too. Yeah, very cool. Um, I was actually, I was looking over your blog, and um, I looked at the, kind of your favorite films of 2015, one of the posts you had on there, mm -hmm. and it kind of tied into what we were talking about tonight with a bunch of these films that were on there, um, either in the honorable mentions or actually in the top, you know, 10 films or VOD releases, um, sort of the genre stuff like Spring or Turbo Kid, uh, We're Still There, yep. or Bone Tomahawk. And I guess uh, It Follows ended up getting a theatrical release, but it was initially slated to just have a VOD. And thank God for that. Um, that thing was incredible in theaters. What's that? <laughs> I said, thank God for that. That thing was incredible in theaters. Oh, God, yeah. It was easily one of my uh, favorite films of last year. And in fact, uh, Bone Tomahawk as well. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of these films, I really wish I would have had the chance to see them uh, in a theater. And especially even with what we're talking about tonight, this uh, Carnage Park, it's something that's a big widescreen feeling, feels like something from the 70s kind of, or even a little bit from the 90s, oddly enough. But it's something that I won't have the opportunity to here in Tucson, Arizona. So is that something that you miss being able to see these films theatrically? Very much so. Um, Bone Tomahawk is actually a really good example of that, too, because that was a gorgeous movie and i would have loved to have a chance to see that on the big screen but uh you know ended up seeing it on vod like uh, i'm sure most people did right exactly and then um also just kind of it are the genre films they they i feel like people complain a lot about um films in general but it feels like there's a real resurgence in the quality of horror films and thrillers right now if you you know things like the witch and uh it follows these sort of babadook even the sort of art house horror films do you think that we're sort of in a uh horror renaissance perhaps right now or is that just me i don't know if i'd say renaissance only because i don't feel like horror ever really got to a point where it wasn't there wasn't <clears throat> excuse me there wasn't good stuff out there mm. um so often people say, you know, oh, this is the worst year for horror. This is a terrible year for horror. And then when you look at what actually came around that year, there's always some great stuff out there. It's just a matter of finding. I think a lot more of it is going the VOD route these days. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I don't think there's ever really been a point where horror was dead as much as the naysayers like to say so. 
And is that some, well, I kind of, when I, what I'm referring to, there was a specific time that I think of in the nineties, sort of the after uh, effects of scream where while that film I enjoyed, they're all sort of the copycats after that, these sort of self-aware ironic uh, films that came after that. It really was a downtime for horror film for me, I felt like. And, uh, and then there was a period where everything seemed to be a Japanese remake for a little while. And I I don't think that we quite do those well here. (laughs) That's only because we don't. Um, <laughs> but that's, yeah, that, that, there's validity to that. But I think even there, there's still some gems out there that, you know, I mean, <clears throat> even while everything seemed to be a J-horror remake, there was still stuff like Session 9 and things like that that came out that, sure. I mean, really like are gems that are still, you know, in, in fact, still underseen, unfortunately. Session nine seems like that's one that's definitely grown with time now. That that film has found its following at this point, I'd say. Uh, and, and I hope it finds more because I find a lot of people still seem to have not heard of it. I mean, in genre circles, yeah, people love it. But yeah, that's true. It seems one that, uh, you know, like people I talk to at work or what have you have no idea that it's even a thing outside of maybe the David Caruso gif. <laughs> <laughs> that's unfortunate, too, because it's much better than that. <laughs> Um, and so have you seen any of uh, Mickey Keaton's uh, Keating's other films? I haven't. I've been wanting to see Darling because uh, Patrick Bromley over at, at this movie has been championing that for, that one for a while. And I just haven't had a chance to catch up with it yet. It's he, He's doing some really interesting work. Um, Pod also was one that he came out with last year. Um, he has uh, kind of, it seems like he keeps pulling some of the same actors over and over again, like a uh, Larry uh, Fessenden, who was also in uh, We Are Still There, are still here, rather, and he's in um, Carnage Park, is in most of his films, it seems like. And uh, I, was, uh, I was actually going to say oh, that this, this was originally, you know, supposed to be talking about Carnage Park, but I really think it's just an excuse to talk about Larry Fessenden's fringe jacket. <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah, I've, I've kind of, I'm a huge fan. Um, I think he's terrific. And he's one of those guys I've just discovered in the last couple of years, and he's been around forever, it feels like. If you go back and look through his IMDb, um, I, I, there was just a re-release of River of Grass um, that I caught this year, and it was phenomenal. It's a great film. And he just, I, unfortunately, I, I kind of think he kind of got pigeonholed, and people think that he's just doing this Jack Nicholson impersonation, but he's so much more than that. He's such a really interesting actor. Yeah, that's and he's a really smart screenwriter and director as well. His uh, Scream Factory yes. just put out that terrific box set of four of his movies, and it's really solid. There's so much great stuff there. What are the uh, what are the films that are in that box it was, set? Um, Habit, uh, Wendigo, Last Winter, and one that I'm forgetting. <laughs> Fair enough. I can I can I can look that up, figure that out. Um, I'm, so I'm walking over to my shelf as we speak because I know that <laughs> I was just looking at it earlier too. Um, I rewatched Last Winter last week, which is not a favorite of mine of his, but it's still it's it's a movie that has something to say, which. I always appreciate. And that's sort of the, the best horror films, genre films, I think are ones that do have a little bit more on their mind than just the gags. And that's the thing um, is even when it doesn't quite work out, which in that case it sort of didn't, it's still, you know, I mean, there's something about just the, the passion that he brings to it that I really appreciate. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and this one, it's just the supporting cast, like someone like Alan Ruck. It took me about 10 minutes to figure out wh- where I knew him from because I'm not sure I had seen him in a little while. And um, did you have the same reaction or were you right away just, uh, oh, there's Cameron? <laughs> I went, hey, there's Captain Harriman from Star Trek Generations. <laughs> but, uh, okay, <laughs> <fair enough. laughs> but sure, Cameron too. Well, I, I assume that, I mean, there's other ones that are in there that do stand out, but um, that's probably the go-to for most people. And unfortunately, I've never seen Star Trek Generation, so. I don't know that that's unfortunate. You might want to keep it that way. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, no, and, no Telling was the other Larry Fessenden movie on that set, by the way. I haven't seen that. How is that? It's good. That's actually one of my favorites of his. It's it's something special. Okay. And um, with this film, uh, how did you? Is this just something kind of you discovered this weekend when you were looking through stuff that was coming out, or you'd been looking forward to this one? This was actually um, mostly thanks to Twitter because I saw a few people mention it because of Pat Healy, who is just the best. He's so great. That that alone made me want to seek it out. He's one of those names where as soon as I hear Pat Healy is uh, has a decent sized role in something, I know that's something I'm going to want to see. 
Yeah, I had the I had the chance to talk to him about um, Cheap Thrills I, uh, I, about a year and a half ago. I listened to it today, actually. It was great. Oh, did you? Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah he was um, he was a really good guy, and he actually ended up talking a lot longer than I would have expected because it's you know he's definitely above. Uh, doing a show like mine, so it was a really nice guy, really generous with his time too. And and he, and he spoke very well. It was, it was um, I particularly appreciated uh, when you talked to him that you really let let him talk a lot. Like it wasn't just um, you know, a lot of people tend to steamroll over whoever they're interviewing, but uh, he really got to say his piece, and it was great. It, it actually made me want to rewatch Compliance, which is a movie that I really really liked and never wanted to see again until now. <laughs> Um, it's, it's one of those films that it's, I ended up, I've gone back to it a couple times just because, um, these sort of six degrees of separation where you end up talking to one person who's worked on a thing, who's worked on another, and you end up going back through and you have reasons to go back. And with that one, my end road to that was because of the composer. She was someone I had interviewed for another film. And so I went back and rewatched that film and it's just, it's such a good movie. It's such a layered interesting movie and it's so it's one of those ones that you wouldn't accept as sort of a reality if it wasn't true exactly it's it's fantastic and oh my god it's so uncomfortable that i just can't even imagine sitting through it again but i really want to now <laughs> yeah it's a, it's um it's it's not something that i i could imagine having on the shelf and breaking it out once a week kind of just a party <laughs> movie kind of thing but that there's just one of those ones if you want to feel a little bit icky i guess that's a good way to go <laughs> come on over everybody we're watching compliance yeah it's really gonna <laughs> fill out the living room <laughs> yeah, about as much as uh, any of the viewing parties i have at my house <laughs> would fill out probably <laughs> and so what you'll just get people saying well at least it's not star trek generations <laughs> I, I don't even know if I, yeah, I could, I don't know any Trekkies. I don't, don't have any, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I kind of gave up after part two, I think, is where I tapped out. <laughs> but um, so with Carnage Park, um, what are your thoughts on the film? Um, how do you think it stands up sort of to the rest of the films you've seen this year? What are your initial kind of thoughts on it? I thought it was good but not great there were things about it i liked a lot and some things that left me a little bit cold i loved the aesthetic i love that um it wasn't just that it was set in the 70s it was that it felt very 70s um even from the way that it opened with narration like uh it, the title cards kind of texas chainsaw massacre um and there was a moment towards the end that made me think of texas chainsaw as well that i won't mention yet unless you want to talk about no but no please don't uh, yeah. it's this is no normally i don't really care too much about spoilers but this is something that i kind of I, I think not a lot of people are talking about and i'd really like to recommend this movie to people so exactly so i, I don't not wanna, give it away i don't want to spoil yeah. anything um but uh I, I appreciated the way it looked i appreciated someone's on i thought it might have been despite it being an 80 minute movie it felt a little bit overstuffed almost that he was trying to put so much going on at the same time it got not really confusing but there were a few points where it was difficult to track everything that was going on um i see i kind of uh well two things one um i i agree with the style of the film i absolutely love the way it looked um the credits per particularly just the way they just rolled through everybody's names and steamrolled that over so quickly <laughs> i thought it was just this brilliant little touch at first i thought uh, my uh, my apple tv was stuttering or something i thought maybe there was a problem with it then i realized they were doing that on purpose <laughs> oh yeah it's and it's and it kind of has this sort of spaghetti western music at times but then it goes into this bizarre tense kind of orchestral stuff that's sort of synth based and it's really interesting the score here also um so i really liked the style of the, the feel yeah the that the sort of the aesthetic of the film i think is wonderful um but it's such a i, I think it's a really simple story in a way um it, it's really straightforward i felt like um and the way that they sort of dole out the information feels very deliberate and slow it's not um, I, I think you're right that it's not a fast paced 80 minutes, but they do, I think, kind of give you the information here in a very deliberate way. And, and I'm, I'm thankful for that because it doesn't feel like there's any wasted screen time here. Yeah. It wasn't the pace that I had an issue with. I mean, it, it was paced fine. I think the, the thing I had an issue with, it might've been even just been the fact that I was watching it during the day and so much of it is so darkly <laughs> lit 
that it made it difficult to even see what was going on in a couple moments that, uh, which was also a bit on purpose, I think, mm -hmm. but, um, that made it just a little difficult to parse towards the end. But other than that, I mean, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I would certainly recommend it, especially, I mean, based on the performances alone, the two, uh, Pat Healy and, um, was it Ashley Bell was her name? Ashley Bell. Yeah. My God, she was terrific. She's great, isn't she? I thought she was really terrific. I had seen her in Last Exorcism, and she hadn't really stuck with me, but she was really, really good here. Um, the director, he has, um, he works a lot with a woman named uh, Lauren Ashley Carter as well. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. She was in a movie called Jug Face from a couple years ago. I haven't seen that one. Um, she's a really good actress, and he always gets strong female performances out of his uh, leads, and they're never the straightforward genre performances that you see or roles that you see mm -hmm. it's not the sort of damsel in distress screaming woman role that you see in a lot of films and it seems like he writes women really well um and not to kind of give too much away but this is definitely a more layered character than in, you would see in most horror films and i think that's the case with all the characters here Agreed. um with maybe pat healy's playing it up a little bit bigger um but that's okay i'll, I'll go along with him whatever he wants to do and that totally fits the character too i mean and i i don't I mean, if he had underplayed it, it might have come across a little too targets. <laughs> yeah. He was, I, I, I don't think he went too over the top to the point where it's a distraction. And so who do you think this movie would appeal to? Do you think it has the ability to go past the sort of genre crowd or is this something strictly for the sort of uh, horror crowd? That's hard to say because I've, I've seen people, which seems to be a refrain for a lot of movies this year, saying that, you know, it's not a horror movie, which I disagree with. I, I think it's very much a horror movie. Yes. Um, but then again, I see people saying that about The Witch, and I have no idea why people are saying The Witch isn't a horror movie either. I mean, it's it, about an actual witch. Come on. It, they, okay, so I, ha I think that any time that a film is good, they don't want to call it a horror film. Once it elevates above sort of the normal genre tropes that they're used to, um, Critics especially, they're uncomfortable with saying they liked a horror film because they assume that only um, slasher movies and it's sort of playing into the most base ideas there and that, you know, they're going to be discredited by enjoying a horror film. And by the same time, at the same time, I kind of hate that opinion because it's only they can only appreciate sort of the art house stuff like The Witch. And that's a damn shame. Right. And from critics, I, I almost understand it. But from from genre fans, I don't get it when they start saying that something like The Witch isn't a horror movie or like Carnage Park isn't a horror movie. I don't know <laughs> where the line is for them. And, and I don't know. I just, I, it's just a mentality I don't understand. Why not embrace this terrific you know, couple of movies? I think it's because they're the type of people that um, they don't want to hear the band's new stuff when they go out. <laughs> Um, and so they have very limited expectations of what they want horror to be. I kind of see it as a really wide canvas that you can do a lot with. Um, and so, it, you know, there's plenty of room in there for something like Friday the 13th, or there's also plenty of room for The Shining. And so those are two films couldn't be further apart as far as the quality of the film that's made or what you get out of those movies. But they're still both horror films. And they do both have quality sweaters. <laughs> They do have really quality <laughs> sweaters. Um, although I, I have to go with the Apollo one from um, The Shining. Absolutely. If there was one that I was going to. Okay. Yeah, right. I couldn't disagree there. <laughs> and so. Sorry, um, Mrs. Voorhees. <laughs> and um, th that's, I hadn't read that because I tend to um, avoid people's opinions till after I've seen the film. And I just watched this today. Um, so I, I wasn't aware that sort of the horror crowd is dismissing this film. That, that's a shame. Um, because this is a really good movie. Um, might not have worked 100% for you, but I, I really dug this one. This is one of my favorites of the year so far, it, as far as an, a gut reaction to it. That'll take a little while to settle in, but you know, just from today, it feels like one of the more satisfying experiences I've had. And it's one that may grow on me in future viewings. I mean, I certainly didn't dislike it at any point. I mean, it, I very much liked it. It just wasn't quite a home run for me, but I, it's a movie that I'll definitely give another shot to. Okay. And um, what would be the films that you would say were a home run for you this year? This year? Um, well, The Witch was one. Uh, sure. The, the Witch knocked out of the park for me and is the first horror movie I've seen in a while that legitimately scared me, which was a nice touch. 
<laughs> that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what if all else even came out this year. I'm uh, ill prepared for such a question. Uh, I, I think probably one of the more underrated films of the year, which is so bizarre that a film by Linkletter would be underrated, but you know, everybody wants some is one of those ones that nobody seems to be talking about. And I thought that was a great movie. Yeah, Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to see that yet, but I'm a big fan of his. So I definitely want to check it out. Yeah. You would expect after sort of the, the, after the love that boyhood got that, you know, usually when you're post Oscar, the next one that you step up to the plate with people are paying attention to it, but no one seemed to care about a baseball movie from him. Mm. The other one that really stands out to me from this year was green room. Oh God. Yes. That was, re- that's such a really terrific. fucking great movie. Yeah, it is. Um, that, that, that's one of those, um, have you seen his other stuff? Uh, the director, uh, with, uh, um, blue room. I saw blue room. Yes. And have you seen murder party yet? I did. Uh, that was a lot of fun. That's he has, there's a, he has, he's probably one of the most interesting directors working right now with his, uh, his ability to pace a film, the way that he introduces stories mm-hmm. is unlike anybody else. I think working today. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, he's, uh, in fact, particularly in green room, I thought it was handled really well because the way the tension builds in that movie is very different from if anyone else had been handling the same material, I think, uh, it could have gotten, it could have gotten away from them, which it didn't from him. I think he really built that up nicely. And do you have, um, any, For me, there was a lot of things in that movie that sort of hit close to home because I uh, grew up listening to punk rock music and I knew a lot of kids like that. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as he said, I have a really bad idea and he goes into sort of fuck you Nazi skinhead, I, I, you know, it's the dead Kennedys. I knew exactly where they were going with that. And I was so on board with those kids. Oh yeah, absolutely. There was, um, there's another movie, um, I just saw it's on Netflix. I'm not sure if, have you seen a movie called they look like people? No, it's another one I've been hearing about, but I haven't gotten a chance to catch up with it yet. Do yourself a favor. Check that one out because that's one of those little sleeper movies that I think really needs to find an audience because it's a, it's one of the smarter movies I've seen in a long time where it doesn't give you the ending that you think you want and you're much better off for not getting what you wanted. Hmm. Do, do you know what I mean? When something is uh, a movie sort of goes against where you want it to go and where you expect it to go. But then you realize you're working with someone that's a lot smarter than you. And there's a reason why they're the one telling the story. That sounds fantastic. All right. (laughs) Um, But then, uh, so just uh, kind of with uh, Carnage Park here, um, this is, I think, one of those movies that uh, it might grow with time, but I I worry that this is the type of movie that's not going to find its audience. It is going to end up, just disappearing to Netflix in a couple months from now. And if it doesn't have a good poster, it might not rise to the top of people's queues and they'll get this confused with a lot of other stuff. But um, is this something that you would put on sort of the level of a starry eyes? Oh, and starry eyes is terrific. Um, I think I liked starry eyes more, at least initially uh, to a point where that's one that I really want to see champion. And I really want to see people noticing um, mm-hmm. kind of like a cheap thrills a few years ago it was all the same kind of thing where yes, it seemed unfairly dismissed and people didn't really know it was out there. And man, does that deserve an audience? God, yeah. Uh, this one, I don't know that I feel that strongly about it to, to, at, to that point, but maybe after another viewing or two. Is this something you think you'll go back and rewatch though? I do. Definitely. Even if just to watch you know, the two leads do what they do again. Cause that's, Excellent. that's the kind of thing that really hooks me into a movie like this is just kind of watching them work and seeing what they do with their characters. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I think on the basis of that alone, I'd happily watch it again. <laughs> and so, um, where, uh, where would it, where would you, um, uh, kind of, uh, God, I'm kind of losing my thought here. Sorry. Um, if you were thinking about, um, writing about film, is this something that you would take the time to sit down and maybe spend a little bit of time to write about? Because I know you, you keep up a blog, um, and you do post every once in a while. Is this something keep up might be pushing it a little bit. <laughs> it's been a while <laughs> since I posted anything. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's something that I would, I would love to. Okay. Uh, excellent. It's something I've, I've been trying to dig into. It's just a matter of finding the time <laughs> to finding the time to do it. Yep. Yeah. 
And there is another question I have, because on Twitter, you go by Dr. Underscore David Underscore Banner. Um, do you have, I, I assume you have a huge affection for the Incredible Hulk, or is that just something ironic? Uh, no, I, I do have a huge affection for it. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, it was my favorite show. And mm. I've always uh, just really enjoyed Bill Bixby and really enjoyed the whole thing. So I just, uh, when I first got Twitter, I didn't want to use my actual name. I tried to think of <laughs> what would work, and that was the one that popped in my head so and so <laughs> is there it, years now. It, so is he your go-to then as far as uh your favorite banner or i guess so yeah yeah, yeah more so than um mark ruffalo or ed norton yeah i mean nothing against them uh especially mark ruffalo because he's great but um <laughs> and seems easier to work with <laughs> but uh <laughs> but bill bixby was just uh i mean i i Loved. He was one of the first actors I noticed when I was a kid. Uh, like in other words, if I saw him in something other than the Hulk, I would sort of pay attention to what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And he was like I was just saying about Pat Healy, like watching the way he kind of approaches material. I had the same yes. sort of feelings about Bill Bixby. So he was one of the first people that really sunk in with me that way. Okay, so if there was one thing outside of the Incredible Hulk that you could recommend for somebody, because that's the only thing I know from him, what should I see of Bill Bixby's? Uh, the Magician was great. It was a TV show that did not last terribly long, but uh, he was he was great in it. It's just, just um, well, he plays a magician. That's all I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, is that from the eighties also, or is this seventies? Uh, seventies. Uh, okay. All right. Fantastic. I'll, I'll give that a shot. Um, and so, uh, where should I send people to, uh, find more of your stuff online? Uh, well, I've got my blog is at mushnicksflorist.blogspot.com. And, and that's a little shop of horrors thing. Yeah. It's just, um, my grandfather who, uh, who passed away a few years ago, his name is Seymour. And it uh, was just sort of a running gag in our family, the, the, all the Feed Me Seymour stuff. That's what, when I started the blog, it was really because of him. So I uh, named it for him and decided that Mushnik's Florist would have to be where Seymour can be found. So. Nice. And uh, what, just one last question here. What led you to start writing about movies and kind of uh, being centered to that online and kind of wanting to have that conversation with strangers? <laughs> um, it's always been what I've been passionate about ever since I was a kid. I had um, a friend who was, uh, when I was about 12 or 13, was a big, you know, he was a subscriber to Fango and just uh, really into horror movies. And he kind of showed me how that can be and showed me like, uh, you know, got me into movies and got me into Fangoria and that kind of stuff. So horror movies in particular Mm -hmm. have always been the passion. (coughs) Excuse me. No, you're fine. Uh, what what is it about horror films, though? Is it the, uh, is it the gore? Is it the sort of the seeing something that's maybe a little bit dangerous when you're a kid that you're not supposed to be watching? It's never really been the gore. It's more been um, that sense of the way they can kind of control you, the way they can manipulate an audience and really like mm-hmm. suck you in like no other genre. And the main thing was the fandom was actually a big part of what got me into it. Because when I went to my first Fango convention, which I think I was 15, Mm -hmm. like, you see all these, you know, big, scary dudes in costume. You know, they were all tattooed up. And this is back in, like, 1991, 1992, when that wasn't everywhere. Oh, I I remember. (laughs) So, like, you see, like, you know, some of the scariest-looking people who turned out to be (laughs) the nicest people you could ever meet. Like... It's amazing to me still when you go to a horror convention that you will never run into a nicer group of people than the people who populate horror conventions. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and so, that, I mean, that's that just, I didn't even know. I thought I was pretty aware of what was going on in the uh, horror community, but I've never been to a horror convention before. I've never been to anything like that i didn't even know that you called fangoria fango see i'm <laughs> out of the loop i had no clue yeah it's um the the horror fans share their passions better than just about any group of people i've seen and that just totally called to me like i love the way it was just about wanting to share the thing they loved it wasn't about like hey yeah. this movie is better than that movie and you suck because you think that one's good it was nothing like that 
It was all just, hey, this is great. Let me share this with you. Let me show you what this is like. Absolutely. And I just yeah, love you know, that. You're, you're, you're right. There's a... Um... There's an element of that that it, that you don't see in sort of these other genres that people love, where um, they a lot of it seems to be kind of taking down the other people's work, you know, kind of like the DC versus Marvel stuff, or you know, any, anything like that, where you get into these sort of subgenres of films where the fans that are very passionate about it, it seems like the way they can express part of that is by tearing down somebody else's work and. That's kind of one of the things that I just immediately started doing when I started writing about films and interviewing people. I never wanted to talk about anything I didn't like because I felt like there was enough negativity out there. I just wanted to kind of support the things that I love. Exactly. Um, yeah, and, and that, I think that's part of the big thing with horror. You're absolutely right, and you never hear people talk about that. Um, and that, that, it's, that's what draws me to a lot of people I particularly like to read online, people like um, Patrick Bromley or Scott Weinberg yes. or John Squires. Yeah. Yeah, definitely uh, Heather Wixon they're all people who just all they want to do is share what they love and they're not there to shit on anyone's movies they're not there to tell you you're wrong for liking this or not liking this they're there to just be fans and show you what they love and that's fantastic I was specifically with Scott Weinberg I've been turned on to several films from him yeah me too yeah, he generally throws out a tweet saying what to watch on VOD this weekend, and it's usually one of the more um, uh, accurate uh, assessments of my personal taste. I made the mistake of reading his book, and when I say the mistake, it's because it led me to blind buying maybe a dozen movies because <laughs> there was so, he made them sound so good that I was like, all right, I've got to see that as soon as possible. And what was the one that was a mistake, or what, was there any no, out there I just so touting the good ones? I just meant mistake because it it, it cost me money. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, because you know he he would he gets so passionate about it, and they sound so good. I'm like, well, now I have to see that right away. So like, I, one of them was Cold Prey, which I hadn't seen before, mm -hmm. and it sound he made it sound so great that I you know went out and bought it and watched it like as soon as it showed up in the mail. And man, that movie's terrific. Cold Prey. Who's in that? I haven't even heard of that. Uh, it's a foreign movie. It's, it's, I want to say Norwegian. Okay. And it's scary and fun and it's just, it's a blast. I'm literally writing that down right now <laughs> so I can <laughs> check that out. And you can read about it in Scott Weinberg's book. So there you go. See, there you <laughs> the go. Modern I, and I, need, I need to get around to reading that also. The last thing of his that I sort of spent in the extended period of time with was um, the It Follows uh, commentary track that he hosted. Yes. Just um, make sure you save up some money before you read it because you're going to need it because you're going to want to seek out all these movies that he's talking about. Yeah, that that I, I that happened with a couple of um, books that I've read about old school horror films and reading about the stuff that got Joe Dante um, working. There was a book called um, I got a Shock Value, I think it was, yeah. where it kind of interviewed a bunch of yeah, okay, so um, and it kind of went into the stuff that got those guys to pick up cameras, and I went back trying to see it. And a lot of that stuff, I think there's a disconnect for me because I'm, you know, I'm a little bit older now. I'm 40. But when I was first getting into those movies, that's, you know, two generations removed. And it feels like that might be kind of the old Western stuff doesn't do it for me the way it did for those guys. Right. And a lot of stuff is of the area. You know, you had to have seen it in, you know, 1978 or in 1985 sure. for it to really resonate with you the way it did with them at those points. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to do this, man. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you for the offer. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and that'll be kind of the out there roughly. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at endings. I'm worse than fucking Stephen King. I have no idea how to end a conversation or end anything. It's usually why I just fade things out for the most part because I have no way of like wrapping things up and I feel like I want to do the Mark Maron. Are we good? Everything okay? Anything else you need to say? But that just like comes across as rude and I, I just met you. So as a Stephen King constant reader since, you know, for, for over 30 years now, I, I can say that that's fine. I, I totally get that. <laughs> <laughs> with, with the exception of the cell or um, cell rather, I thought that that ending of that book was phenomenal and they really botched that in the film. I haven't seen the movie yet. Um, it's on my list, but uh, have you read the book? Though? I have. And I did like the ending on that one. Yeah, that's probably one of my favorite of his stuff of the last probably 15 years or so um, with the ending specifically. I thought it was great. I felt like he was trying to channel um, sort of the ending that Frank Darenbaum did for The Mist. Which still kicks me in the stomach every time I think about it. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's one of those few adaptations that just absolutely works. Yep, actually, oh, cool. arguably better than the story. Um, I I would go ahead and say yeah, it is. Yeah, it's definitely better. The um audio book where they do the three D sound on I've it is pretty that. fun. Yeah, yep, there, okay. that's a lot of fun. Excellent. Very cool, man. Well, I will um, probably have this up tomorrow morning, uh, probably middle of the night tonight, and I'll go ahead and post that, okay? Awesome. Uh, my apologies to everyone for having to hear my voice. <laughs> no, thank you so much, man. You, you're actually, you're really good. Have Have you done other shows before then? I have not. Oh, well, excellent. Well, you should consider doing this. You're good at it. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.